I mean, you know, some of my direct reports, Hannah and Brandon, they will look directly at me and say, you are not doing this and I need you to do this. You are falling short on this. And then it's my responsibility to be humble and receive that feedback and not disagree with it and accept it and say, okay, I'm going to commit to it. And I'm going to, I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to listen to you. And then I'm going to make sure that I go to work on, on that. Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I've ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly, and I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done, and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity training trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and how you can get $1,000 off software licensing when you place an order, that's right guys, $1,000 off, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $1,000 off software licensing when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. This episode is brought to you by the Resistance Exercise Conference, the science and application of strength training for health and human performance. Would you like to learn from the top strength training researchers, network and connect with other exercise professionals from all over the world, join a welcome reception on a Friday night to build relationships with other strength training professionals, experience an early morning workout from an expert trainer to kickstart your Saturday, and get inspired, rejuvenated, and focused on your strength training business, I certainly do, and that is why I am attending and interviewing all of the speakers at the event. The Resistance Exercise Conference will be held on the 9th and 10th of March 2018 in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the Commons Hotel. To get 10% off your entry fee, head on over to resistanceexerciseconference.com, click the registration button, and enter Corporate Warrior 10 in the promo code field in PayPal. I'm very excited about this and I've wanted to attend for years. Sign up now at resistanceexerciseconference.com and get 10% off with promo code CORPORATEWARRIOR10 and I look forward to meeting you in person. Hey guys, I am Lawrence and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the number one high intensity training podcast that teaches you how to optimize your high intensity training protocol and your hit business to help you achieve your health, fitness and business goals. My former guests include people like Mark Sisson, Rob Wolf, Dr. Doug McGuff, Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, Jay Vincent, Noah Kagan, Keith Norris and many, many more. My next guest is Luke Carlson, who joins me for a part four on the show. Luke is one of the most revered and successful CEOs within the strength training industry. His business, Discover Strength, has three locations in the US, which are among the highest session volume and revenue training facilities in the world, and the hallmark for a lot of up-and-coming fitness business owners. Luke is someone I turn to for advice all the time. He's the greatest fitness business mind I know and has been instrumental in helping me think bigger and improve my business. When it comes to business and time management, Luke is a man after my own heart. We're both massive time management geeks. And in this episode, we dig into his business and time management strategy with a fine tooth comb. 
You will learn exactly how Luke plans his day and gets important things done, how he cultivates leadership and executes on big ideas, how he structures group training sessions, and much, much more. For all of the show notes and links for this episode and all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org. And don't forget to hang around at the end of this episode for your free gift. And now I give you Luke Carlson. Luke, welcome to the show. Hey, it's really, really my pleasure to, to join you. Thanks for having me, Lawrence. How's it going? It's going fantastic. It's uh, the Tuesday of the week of Thanksgiving here in the U.S., and Thanksgiving is an uh, awesome holiday, and so it's, it's a really a fun week for all of us. Awesome. How's business? Man, business is great. We just wrapped up with the single best week in, in company history. So the number wow. that we always look at is the number of sessions that we did. So the number of workouts we did. So of course, revenue matters and um, some other metrics really matter. But the number that our staff can always wrap their head around is the number of sessions that we did. And we broke our all time uh, session record this past week and you know every few weeks or every few months we break that but we really shattered it we did um 1336 workouts last uh, week which was awesome for us across our three locations that's amazing congratulations yeah thank you we were excited I remember in uh, one of our previous interviews, I think it was one of our, it may be our first, where you said you'd done 800 workouts or something to that number. So that, sure. and that yeah. was that, you were really impressed by that number. So to yeah. have smashed that is awesome. Yeah, we're excited. Um, that's an interesting point to start on because um, sometimes I wonder if, if when it comes to goal setting, if setting money or revenue as a goal is a bad idea because I, d- I do think it becomes relatively arbitrary. How do you think about that? And do you feel like setting a revenue goal is a, is a, can promote the wrong behavior within your organization? No, I think setting I – actually, I actually disagree with you. And if Skylar's listening, um, I do think that's a great question, by the way. But I, uh, I think that having a revenue goal is incredibly important because a revenue goal will always tell you the size of the company. And so if you say, hey, 10 years from now, I want to be a – $1 million enterprise, a $10 million or a $100 million enterprise, right away we are now crystal clear on the size of the organization. And so I think that the revenue goal matters because it tells you size and it tells you scope. And then you can have measurables underneath that revenue goal that uh, are a little bit more meaningful and resonate with everybody on the team, not just just revenue. But my goodness, if, if I think, if I go to work every day and I think we're building a $100 million company and one of my coworkers my close colleague thinks we're trying to build a two million dollar organization then we are not going to be rowing in the same direction so we need total clarity on the size and i think the best way to measure that is is revenue what are you trying to build what is your what is your revenue goal yeah that's that's a great question um so we have what's called or we use what's called a, a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. So that's the longest term goal in the organization. It's usually seven to 10 years out. And we've been operating under a BHAG that is 10 locations and $10 million in revenue. Well, that's due the last day of 2020. Well, when we get three years out from that goal, we set a new longer term goal. So uh, in about a month, or just under a month, my leadership team will, will go away and we'll uh, stay in a hotel for a couple of days and we'll meet for a couple of days straight and we'll decide what that next long-term goal is going to look like. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be somewhere between $25 million and $100 million. And I know that's a huge range. We just don't know what the right solution is yet, but we'll have that conversation at that point. So the long-term goal that we've been operating under for a long time was 10 million and now as we approach that from a time standpoint we'll extend that and we'll look at what the next seven to ten years looks like and um it'll be between like i said 25 and 100 million that's so cool um and i i believe that well i believe of almost absolute certainty that you achieved that and it's um it's really cool to hear um you know, having seen Corporate Warrior grow in popularity and impact, I can see how one can get so motivated to want to achieve that. But I don't want to 
assume so what what you all strike me as being so motivated like you never seem to have well from what i see a down day uh, i'm sure you do you are human like the rest of us but what you know what motivates you well, the first thing is is I really make sure that everything I'm doing or the vast majority of what I'm doing is stuff that I really enjoy and that I'm passionate about. And that sounds like a cliche, but it's not. I mean, I have to make sure that when I wake up in the morning, I look at my day and I look at the things that my day is, is filled with. I mean, there's two filters. One, you know, if I only had another year left on this planet, is this really how I want to be spending my time? And if I look back, you know, when I'm 85 years old and I say, I wish I would have done more of this or more of that. Am I really, is is my day filled with the things that I feel are the right things from that standpoint, with from that filter? And for me, the answer has always been yes. I mean, there's nothing I'd rather do than the things I'm doing in my day. Now, the second filter, and this is almost a separate discussion, is are all of those things the most important things that move the organization forward? You know, have I Pareto principled my day? Am I making sure that I'm only touching the things that I can be touching, that I need to be touching, and I'm delegating everything else? That's almost a separate conversation. So my overall motivation comes from the fact that I'm engaged in things that I really enjoy. The second thing is um, uh, the, the founder, not the founder, the longtime CEO of Starbucks, Howard Schultz, he had a brilliant quote. Um, and I, I don't know if I've ever talked about this with you before, but he said, everyone says that if you have passion in a given area, then you'll, you'll be excited to go learn about that topic or that area. He said, what we found in our company is the inverse. When we teach somebody about something or when someone learns about a particular topic, then their passion for that topic starts to grow. And so what I've been able to do is, is continually learn in so many different areas. And as I immerse myself in a great book or any type of learning, my goodness, my passion for that topic increases. And so if I'm ever low on passion, I just surround myself with some learning. So like an example, I'm on an airplane at least at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. And so I'm always uh, downloading your podcasts going into the flight. So if I if I want to go deep on some strength training cognitive function, um, I'm going to listen to Teresa's podcast. And I get done with that podcast and I think, my goodness, this is an area of research that's so important. And I've, I've, I've reinvigorated my passion for that particular topic. I'm reading now the biography of of John D. Rockefeller, you know, arguably the richest single human to ever live, great entrepreneur um, throughout the mid 1800s, late 1800s into the early 1900s in the U.S. And you can't read that book and not have your passion for building a great enterprise grow. So that's, I think, been my other my other um, key element is that I am always making sure that I'm surrounding myself and and learning around the areas that I need to focus on so that my passion for those areas increases. Just out of interest, I'm I'm interested to learn about your kind of uh, learning um, tactics and how you kind of synthesize information. When you listen to one of my podcasts, will you take notes or will you just kind of let it sink in and then move on to the next thing? Like, how do you synthesize that? Yep. So I'll do one of two things. I'll I'll understand usually going into it if it's a podcast that I'm just going to listen to and kind of enjoy. So really the way I listen to your podcasts and I have a few other podcasts that fall into this category, I'm going to listen to them when I am on an airplane. I'm going to listen to them when I'm on a, a run. So I do a lot of running. And so it's a great way for me if I'm doing an hour long run, I'll listen to an hour long podcast. I'll tell you, I listened to your first episode with Brad. I can remember what treadmill I was on in our office building here, <laughs> listening to that podcast. And the beauty of that is I can be on a run. And if I, I, Brad says something or you say something and I start thinking about a topic, I can rewind it and, and go back and listen to the rest of it. So a few of your episodes, I know that I'm not going to take notes and I'm not going to take action on some of it. I just want to uh, absorb it and kind of think about it. And usually then I send a message out to a few colleagues and say, have you listened to Lauren's latest episode? We got to talk about this. Um, and that's really been fun. Um, 
And then there's a few episodes that I'll say, okay, I need to sit down and have, I have one key notebook. It's like my key idea notebook. And I'll have that in front of me when I listen to like Teresa's or Stu Phillips or a few of the other podcasts where I know I want to take some great notes. And then I want to take that information and I want to put it into one of the PowerPoint presentations I use when I speak or stuff that we want to include when we develop our staff, things we want to be sharing with our own clients. So information that I know I'm going to try to build into different systems and in our business and in my life cool and that's a, a neat segue into time management which i think certainly just having you know worked with you and interacted with you i get the feeling that you have excellent organization skills organizational skills i should say um talk to me about meetings because i know that meetings get thrown around certainly in the modern age of being a complete waste of time but i know that you use them very very strategically within your business so can you talk to me about how you use meetings in discover strength yeah, so if you talk to anybody at Discover Strength, from our leadership team down to a, a relatively new employee, I think they'll all tell you that a well-run meeting and what we would define as the weekly meeting is the most important use of time in any organization. So if, if a meeting is run correctly, it's a time saver. People walk around in business culture today and say that, man, if I didn't have to go to meetings, I could actually get something done. And they talk about how much they dread going to meetings. Well, the reason is not because the meetings are not productive. It's because those meetings are poor meetings. And so I think we're in a business culture where most people do not run excellent meetings and do not know what an excellent meeting looks like. And that's coming from someone who ran hundreds of very mediocre to, to subpar meetings. And so now I understand what it means to have a truly great meeting. When I visit other companies in, in our industry or different industries, the first thing that I'll ask to do is I'll say, well, I would love to watch some workouts. And I would love to watch your front desk staff. And I'd love to interact in different departments. But the one thing I really want to see is I want to attend a meeting and I want to see how that meeting is run because I learned so much about that organization by attending that meeting. So we have a 90-minute meeting format that everyone attends weekly. So the leadership team of the organization has a once-per-week 90-minute meeting. Each one of our locations, all of the trainers, attend one 90-minute meeting. Um, our, our department heads and our managers attend one 90-minute meeting. Everyone's in on one 90-minute meeting. And that 90-minute meeting is central to the productivity of our locations, our individual performers, and our leadership team. Lawrence, I've said this multiple times. I feel like I could attend our weekly leadership team 90-minute meeting. And if that's the only thing I did all week and I didn't work in the business and I didn't work on the business whatsoever and I just attended that meeting, I still feel like I'd provide value to the organization because that meeting is, is so important. What's the ad agenda of that meeting? So, yeah, great question. So, um, sorry, Skylar. Uh, that's an excellent question, but it starts off with a segue. So we segue into, hey, we're now in meeting mode. And the way we do that segue is we just go around the room and, and everyone gives their their positive news. So their highlight professionally and their highlight personally for the week. So we're just kind of connected for the first couple of minutes. And then we go into rapid fire reporting mode. So we're reporting on the KPIs of the organization. We call it a scorecard. We're reviewing the scorecard. We're reviewing our 90 day priorities. So what are the big projects we're working on this quarter? So everyone goes around and talks about whether or not they are on track or off track. And they shouldn't, they don't, they don't actually talk about it. They just comment, I am on track or I am off track. And then we'll do what we call customer employee headlines. So we're just going through the headlines of what's going on with our staff and what's going on with customers. That's our way of doing market research. We use Net Promoter Score or Net Promoter System. And so we get a tremendous amount of feedback from that. We're sharing all is that, that. software? What is that? So Net Promoter Score was developed by Bain, which is a massive consulting company in the U.S., and I think almost every Fortune 500 in the world uses Net Promoter, but it's a way to understand whether or not your customer is a loyal customer, all right, and it's going to predict how long that customer stays. So Net Promoter Score gives you a number, and that number essentially assigns a customer to a promoter, 
a neutral or a passive person or a detractor. And of course, you want as many promoters as possible. So a couple companies that have really high net promoter scores would be like Tesla, uh, the the car company. Um, Apple stores have really high net promoter scores. Um, and so we have one of the highest net promoter scores that I've that I'm familiar with, and, and that's a great pulse on on the type of service we're providing, the type of loyalty we have from our customer. So you get a score, you get a number, but then you also get um, feedback from the customer. And it's it's all centered around one question. And the book that was written about it, it's called the ultimate question. And the question is this: How likely are you to refer a friend or a colleague to X, Y, and Z business. So, so for us, it's discover strength. And they just give you a 1 to 10. And if they give you a 9 or a 10, they are a promoter. If they give you a 7 or 8, they're neutral. And if they give you anything less than a 6, they're a detractor. And so um, there's a, a calculation for how you get, not, not an average, but how you get your overall score. And I don't want to go into that now, but it's a great way to understand um, the consistency of your, the quality of the service that you're providing, and you can make iterative changes based on the feedback that you get from customers. So that's a whole separate podcast topic there. But so we review that. So in the first 20 minutes of the meeting, we've now done a check-in and we've gone through all of the key numbers, our KPIs. We've gone over our, our key projects for the quarter and we've done kind of this market research component. Then we get into the bulk of the meeting, which is solving issues. And when it comes down to it, most most organizations, and I swear, Lawrence, I invented this, most organizations just talk about issues, but they don't actually ever solve the issues and make the issue go away. So we use uh, an IDS format where we identify the issue, we discuss the issue, and then we solve the issue. So all week long, all of our teams are adding issues to an issues list. And that issues list is just a Google document. And so the issues list could be anything that you need to talk about, a decision that needs to be weighed in on. For our trainers, it could be, hey, what are we doing for hand position on this exercise? Or how are we recording number of reps when we do this type of breakdown set because we've had some inconsistency? Instead of sending out 16 emails about it, we just put it on the issues list. And during that weekly meeting, we'll solve that particular issue. So when I walk into, like I'll walk into my meeting on Friday, and I'll probably have 70 issues on that issues list. And what we do is we just rank order the three most important issues, one, two, and three. We solve those issues. When we're done with those issues, we pick three additional issues, rank order them the most important issues. So we're always solving the most important issues in the organization or in a particular location in order. And and we do that for exactly 50 minutes. And all of those solves are to-dos. So when we solve an issue, it may involve four or five or six to-dos, and that to-do is always a seven-day to-do. So I know what Brandon needs to do in the next seven days. I know what Hannah needs to do in the next seven days. I need. I know what I need to do in the next seven days. So we move from just having discussion and debate around issues to actually having solves that resort in action because nothing happens unless we actually take action. And I have alluded to this, but I used to run meetings where we just talk about stuff ad nauseum and then nothing would ever happen. And, And guess what we were talking about three months later, the same issue, you know, the issues never went away because we never got to the root, the root issue. We never identified the root issue and then attacked the root issue and came up with a solve for that issue. So I think that's the key is, are we just chatting about stuff in meetings? Are we actually identifying, discussing and solving our issues and then taking action? action on those solves. And then when we start the next meeting the following week, we do a recap of those to-dos. Uh, how many of those to-dos are done? And we just we go through and we say, are they done or not done? So that format really, really moves the whole organization forward that we're always tackling the most important things facing the organization, facing each team, each location. I love that. And I love the elegance of the, you know, getting like, almost like a batch type approach to capturing all of the issues and dealing with them in one hit in a, like a critical mass, as opposed to them pinging you emails all day long, which would be absolutely completely ineffective and inefficient. Um, so no, I absolutely love that. And, and that's, and that's what all of our people have just learned to do. Like if someone approaches me and starts chatting with me about something, I just look at them and say, whoa, whoa, whoa issues list, issues <laughs> list. And they know, okay, I'll just drop it to the issues list. So we don't stress out all week long 
wrong about all the different things that are going on. We just drop it to the issues list, and then we'll get focused, and we'll solve those issues at that time. And then when we're, we're solving those issues, if we find that one of the issues is a large, just a massive strategic issue, then we'll drop it to what we call our quarterly issues list. And then at our quarterly offsite meeting as a, as a leadership team or management team, then we'll attack a big strategic issue. If, if we know we're not going to tackle it in a, in a weekly meeting for 50 minutes, we put it on that long-term issues list and we'll attack it at a quarterly offsite meeting. This is interesting um, because this is, I think, very similar to focusing on the constraint, which I heard you talk about in another podcast in terms of focusing on that constraint that's stopping you from growing your business. Can you give us an example of one of these big um, issues? If, is there any that you're, you're, you're able to talk about? Yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll give you two examples. Um, well, first of all, a constraint. So I think the idea of the constraint is a leader of an organization better know at all times what is the single greatest constraint that is the truly the bottleneck? It's the kink in the hose that if you figured out that one constraint, you'd be able to produce so much more throughput. You'd be that much more productive and effective as an organization if you solved just that one constraint. The problem is most entrepreneurs, owners, operators, they're fighting all different fires and focusing on everything. And we're almost taught to do that. We're almost taught to pay attention to our customers and our employees and our marketing and our and all the different aspects of the business. And instead, what we really should do is throw ourselves completely into the biggest constraint of the organization. And until we figure out that constraint, we can't move on to anything else. And I'm telling you, I've watched colleagues do this over the last 10 years where I've identified from afar what their constraint is, and I've told myself, or maybe I've told maybe I've told one of my close colleagues in confidence, I've said, until they figure out this one constraint, that business will never never move forward. And six years later, they still have that one constraint in place. And of course the business hasn't moved forward meaningfully. So I think we have to identify that constraint and we need all of our attention and energy on the one constraint until that constraint is completely blown up, it is eradicated, and then we move on to the next constraint. Um, so for us, I'll tell you right now, what our biggest constraint is, is developing an app. And that app is how we will record workouts on the actual floor. So right now, Lawrence, if you're in any of our facilities, all of our trainers have a clipboard and a pencil and a, a printed workout card of that client's workouts. And every one of our clients has file folders with all the different workout cards they've been through. After you've completed 20 workouts, we type and we send you a printed progress report that talks about your progress on your most recent two routines that you've been doing. And then we also do what we call an assessment workout where you do a standardized seven exercises in the same order. And then you'll get a long-term progress report on how you performed in that assessment workout. Well, my goodness, that's a very laborsome process, and it doesn't allow our client to interact with their workout data on a regular basis. So we're developing an application now where – after every single workout, the client will get meaningful feedback and data, charts and graphs that they can understand sent to them immediately after the, the workout so they can understand, am I improving? Now, Lawrence, you're probably a lot like me in that you are all about the process. I'm about the process. Like I, I don't care as much about did I get one more repetition than last time. I care about the, the process and did I execute all the key elements of the workout uh, from a process standpoint. But I know that our client cares about data. They want to interact with some data to know that they're improving um, on, on all the different exercises that they're doing. So until we get this app figured out, which we've been working on for about a year and a quarter now, and I could, I'm not going to go into it, but we've, we've pivoted so many different times. And finally, this quarter, I said, hey, this is our single constraint. Nothing else can move forward in the organization until we figure this out. This allows our clients to train at our different locations. It allows our front desk staff, our concierge, to no longer file workout cards. It allows our trainers to provide this meaningful de uh, uh, feedback to our clients automatically. It unloads our team leads, our location managers, where they don't have to produce these reports and send these progress reports to our clients. It is the biggest thing that if we figure it out, it moves the organization forward. So that's our current constraint. Um, so I think you got to throw yourself into that constraint completely. Now, an example of a strategic issue would be um, 
like a, a process overhaul. So if we find out that the process for onboarding one of our um, one of our new trainers is is off, we're not going to solve that in a 50 minute uh, IDS session on a Friday when our leadership team meets. We need to talk about that at a quarterly offsite and and throw ourselves into what that should look like have that discussion, and then we'll probably make it a, a, a priority for the next quarter where one person's going to own it and pour all their time and energy into just revamping that process and completing it in the next 90 days. Oh, that's very, very interesting and certainly got me thinking about you know what my biggest constraint is myself. Um, how is it that you currently plan your week? Yeah, well, my weeks are are consistent week after week with the exception of travel. So I know like on Mondays, I see clients on Mondays. I see clients for three hours on Sunday mornings. Fridays are 100% a meeting day. And I got this from Vern Harnish who wrote the book uh, Rockefeller Habits. And he wrote the, the kind of second edition of that book. It's called Scaling Up. And he said, do all your meetings on one day. So on Fridays, we start with breakfast with our leaders and managers from 7 to 8 a.m. And then we go from meetings at 8.30 a.m. until 4.30 p.m. So it is meetings all day long. And one of those meetings is this 90-minute leadership team meeting that I'm telling you about. But we also have individual meetings around what we call rocks, which are the 90-day priorities that, that each person on my leadership team is, is working on. And then I have a meeting with with our operations director every Friday where we go to lunch together. We call it a same page meeting where he and I are solving the operational issues or we're discussing the operational issues so that he and I are on the same page because if he and I are on the same page, man, he can't communicate consistently with the rest of the organization. So we just need to make sure that we're healthy and that we're on the same page. So Fridays are just all meetings. Um, and then I have, here's kind of two time management hacks that, that I use. So, the first one is maybe a little bit of a cliche and people have heard of, but every morning as a part of my morning routine, I write down the three most important things that I need to do that day that move either my personal life or our business toward our stated objectives. So what I used to do is have a to-do list of 38 things that I wanted to do that day. Well, Lawrence, you know this. I, I would I would pick off things that were easy to do or that I wanted to do or that I was excited to do, but I didn't focus on the most important things. So now I just write down the three most important things that I need to work on in order for us to move the organization forward. And I just think, hey, if I can do the three most important things every day, you know, 350 to 360 days out of the year, I know I'm really moving the organization forward. And we've now taught that to our leaders and our managers is make sure we're focusing on those three most important things. And and that's not novel. A lot of people do something like that. But each morning, that's part of the morning routine. Now, the next thing that I do is I have my assistant schedule every day, 90 minutes, 90 minutes in my day that are called top three. So I have a 90 minute period just to work on those top three, because what I've learned is we're, we're really run by our calendars. I will do anything that is on my calendar. Like I couldn't live a day without looking at my Google calendar. So if, if I have a 90 minute period on my calendar for the top three things, that's what I'm going to do for 90 minutes. I'm going to chip away at those top three things. Now, the other thing I have on my calendar is I have two hours on my calendar each day that's called save for something more important. So I will look three, four, five, six, you know, six weeks out, and I, I would find that my entire calendar would be booked. I would, I would talk to my assistant. I would say, Lucia, I'm booked from 6 a.m. until 8 p.m. this day. And now I have an attorney, our attorney calling, and he wants to review this lease with me, and I can't get an hour-long phone call in with him because every minute of the day, all week long, is booked. And this guy won't take a call at 9 p.m. or he doesn't want to do a call on a Sunday. So we got to figure this out. So now what we do is we understand that there's always going to be something more important coming up down the road, and we need to save time for that. So I always have her keep two hours open every single day in the future. So as we get closer to that day, I can fill that two hours with the more urgent things that are going to pop up that need to be worked on. And let me tell you, Lawrence, that's been just a game changer for me is now I know 
when something comes up, like I just had uh, the interior designer that we're working with that are in uh, New York, they're going to fly here in a couple weeks. And they said, hey, I'm going to be in town. Can I meet with you on this day? And normally my answer is no, I can't because that day is completely booked. Now I can say, yep, I've, I have this two hours set aside and I can throw that meeting into that two hour period. So those are a couple of things that have been incredibly effective. Identifying the top three each morning, having 90 minutes set aside for that top three, and then into the future, I always have a two-hour period that's open that I can fill with the more important, urgent things. So don't misunderstand that. I didn't just say that each day I have two hours just open. That two hours always fills up. It just fills up with priorities and meetings that, that come about, you know, one, two, three weeks ahead of time rather than a month or two ahead of time. And I learned that from a great speaker. A guy talked about how to understand that when you take a commitment, when you take a meeting, what you always have to think about is, could there be a more important commitment that comes along? So I'm, I'm joking when I say this. It's like before you commit to a date with a girl on Friday night a month from now, you got to remember, could you meet a girl that you're more interested in that you might want to go on a date with that Friday night? And so before you say yes to that, you always have to be, you always have to have that mindset. So with our work, we've done that. Before we say yes to everything, we make sure we understand there could be more important work that needs to be scheduled. Just with regard to the 90-minute block for the top three, um, what if your assistant books that at the end of the day after you've done a crap load of work and you're absolutely exhausted? Would you still execute on that? Yeah, what a great question again. I've told her, I think everyone has to understand when do they do their most important creative work or when are they most effective at doing that work? And I know I'm the most effective earlier in the morning. So she books that in the morning 90% of the time. If we can't do it in the morning, she'll book it in the afternoon or the evening, and I'll still do it. I just don't think that I'm able to um, think strategically and be as creative as I approach whatever that work is. But she almost always puts it in the morning. Cool. Um, why why Google Cal over, say, iCal or fill in the blank? Why'd you opt yeah, for that? well, if you want the honest answer, it's because my operations director, Brandon, said you have to use Google Cal because I was I, I'm somewhat resistant to technology. I mean, I frankly don't think I'm resistant to technology, but everybody I work with would tell me that I am. And so I, I apparently must be. And he said, hey, you can't we were using the calendar that we schedule all of our workouts on. So we were using mind body and anytime I had a commitment, it would just go into our mind body calendar. And he said, you can't use that Luke. It's archaic. And he said, you're going to start using Google Cal and we're all going to use Google Cal. And so that's just what I use. I, I've really never experimented with anything else, but let me tell you, I couldn't live a day without my calendar in the Google Cal now, because I mean, every literally every half hour of the day, is blocked all day long and it's blocked weeks ahead of time and you know it, it's a cliche but we are run by our calendars if it's on your calendar you're going to do it and so anything that's important we make sure it's on the calendar and i make sure that i'm honoring that and uh enthusiastically engaged in whatever 30 minute block i, I have on the calendar yeah I, I completely agree and i i use my calendar in very much the same way um you talking about those top three things that you pick how do you decide what goes on that list so the filter I use is what's the most important thing that would move the organization forward. And when I think about that, what's the one thing that only I can be working on? I mean, what is true? The filter I always use is what is the true CEO work here? And um, that that has taken a lot of, I guess, development. I've needed to cultivate that skill or that framework over time. Um, there's a great book called Great CEOs Are Lazy. This is a relatively new book. And I listened to that book. I bought it on an uh, audiobook version of it. And it, it really provided a good framework for how to do that. So, so Lawrence, I guess to answer your question, I, I'm just always trying to think about what can only I work on and what, if it's completed, really moves the organization forward meaningfully. Because, Lawrence, I'm addicted to working a lot and I'm addicted to being busy. And if you've ever done like Strength Finder, one of my strengths is 
achiever. And basically an achiever means that you love having a list and you love getting the list done. And at the end of the day, you feel like I did 11 things today. Even on a weekend, you feel like I did the laundry, I ran errands, I went grocery shopping, I got a workout in, and you just feel good that you achieved things on a list. And that can be dangerous because if you're not doing the right things, you're just not going to move the organization forward. So I've had many years of my life and my career where I've been obsessed with being busy. And I, I thought that busyness meant that I was productive, but I wasn't focused on the things that were truly moving the organization forward. So right now, for me, it's usually, hey, if we have a pending real estate deal or development of a facility, which we have two facilities being developed right now, anything related to that is going to be one of my top three because those are so time sensitive. If I don't do what I need to do at a different, uh, at a specific juncture, that location is just not going to move forward. So that's always that's always a priority. Can you, okay, so you've kind of given us an example of those top three, you know, attention to to um, lease information. Is there anything else, any examples you can give of your typical yeah, let top, me, I'm just, yeah. I, I, I used to always write them down and now I'm experimenting with, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Todoist, an app on my phone. Uh-huh. So I'm, I'm using Todoist as an app right now. Um, so one of the big projects is we're working on something when a trainer reaches 10 years with the company. They're now going to become, for lack of a better term, they're going to they're going to get a partner status where they're not going to own equity in the company at 10 years, but at 10 years they're going to get a significant profit sharing. They're going to get an option to go to any conference each year in the world that they want to go to. And frankly, we don't even care if they learn a lot at it. I mean, I hope they do, but we want them to go to it because we just want them to be engaged and kind of be rewarded. They're going to have an annual dinner with the leadership team where we just kind of talk about the direction of the organization. They're going to get a number of perks like that. Well, I have to finalize everything related to that plan. So that was one of my top three where I just know I need to throw myself into this for 90 minutes and really work on this. Okay. Another top three item would be creating our 2018 budget. And I can't do that in 90 minutes, but that might be on my top three list, you know, four or five days in a row where I make sure I get that done. Um, so uh, I, another top three item I had is review the timeline for the build out of, of one of our locations. So so th- those are a couple examples. Uh, that's really useful. And what you were saying earlier about your personality type, I am so exactly the same as that you know like if i'm on a saturday and i'm just out with you know my partner and we're just kind of enjoying nature i start getting after a while i start getting really kind of agitated (laughs) because i don't feel like i'm being productive but how ridiculous is that you know well well two things lawrence first of all i heard you in your productivity podcast where you just talked about what you did in your sales career and you nailed it. I mean, you just, it's, it's kind of a Peter Druckerism that, that, um, the, the worst thing we can do is execute exceptionally well on an item or a project that didn't need to be done in the first place. And so you, you said something like, it's not a matter of how we do things. It's a matter of what we do. And there's a heck of a lot of things that we probably shouldn't be doing at all. So, so maybe that's a little Pareto principle focus. So you, you, you provided a really good reminder of that for me. And I always, I just need a constant reminder of, of that, that am I really focusing on the most important things? And, and Brandon, our operations director, he'll remind me, he'll say, Luke, as the company grows, you got to remember that you can't just use the filter of, am I hanging on to the things that I'm passionate about? And then am I good at, because I'm passionate about a lot and I'm pretty good at a few things but even some of those things i need to stop doing i used to say if i'm passionate about it and i'm good at it if my skill set really lends itself to that activity then i'll keep doing it and even now i've had to i've had to unload many of those things because i may enjoy doing it and i may be good at it but it's still not the right work for me to be doing so i needed to delegate it and let me tell you the biggest constraint one of the biggest constraints to most organizations growth is the entrepreneur holding on to everything. And the entrepreneur is doing that because they think it's the right thing and they think it makes them hardworking. It's actually stymieing the, the entire uh, progress of, of the, the enterprise. And the entrepreneur doesn't normally recognize that. Now, to your point about walking in nature with your partner, um, any girl that I've ever dated will tell you that I am incapable 
of going on a date or doing something social unless I've accomplished like seven things beforehand. I mean, if it's a Saturday, I have to do, you know, I'm a marathon runner. I have to do my run in the morning. I have to do three hours of reading on Saturday first. And until those two things are done, I am incapable of, of enjoying a Saturday, you know, Saturday evening. And that's important. You just got to know yourself and make sure you're doing those things first so that you can be fully engaged in whatever you're doing that evening or that afternoon. Are you married at the moment? I'm not, no. Okay. Uh, are you are you single or have a partner? I am completely single. Oh, okay. So, um, no, it's just so interesting. So take, take, zero, take zero dating advice from me, I guess. Oh, no, not, not judging at all. I was just interested um, in terms of how it was going to inform my next question. But I, yeah, I just wondered, like, how you know, how to tackle that so that, you know, I guess where I'm going with this question is work-life balance is important and, you know, it's trying to, it's trying to work as many hours as we want to um, and be effective, but also make time for relaxation and social time. Because I feel like without that renewal, you may, your productivity may actually suffer. How do you, how do you do that? Do you schedule that kind of fun time in advance? How, how is it you actually make sure you make time for that type of stuff? Yeah. So for me, I have to schedule it. So I can't be spontaneous. Um, cause I think it causes more anxiety when I, when I, um, feel like, well, I just had a three hour period where I wasn't productive. I just need to know when that's going to occur. So a couple examples in the, in the summertime here in Minnesota in the U S uh, on a few weekends out of the summer, I'll get away to my parents' lake place, okay, their cabin. And I know that I'm just going to spend time with family there, and I'm going to be fully engaged with family, and that I'm not focused on productivity. I'll do some reading, and I might do some journaling, but I am going to focus on just being with family. Uh, I love uh, football, American football, so I have season tickets for like the University of Minnesota football team. And when I know when I know when I'm going to go to a game, it's going to be four, five hours of going to the game ahead of time and hanging out with friends, attending the game itself. And I just want to be fully immersed in in that experience. And I just look at that as that's complete downtime where I'm just having fun, and it's okay to it's okay that I'm not working, even working at home. Uh, I don't have a home office, but I love to sit down on the couch and have my laptop on my lap. But I need to, Lawrence, I need to say, hey, am I working right now or am I going to watch this football game on TV? Because otherwise I find myself always having my laptop on my lap, half watching a game, half working on my laptop. I, I did that for years. And so now I say I'm either working or I'm putting this down and I am not working. And that, that little bit of clarity has been so important for me from a productivity standpoint that I give myself a license to shut it down and stop working and, and just, uh, just relax. I noticed that email. You, I'm guessing you schedule your email time <laughs> just based on your current sort of email behavior. There's sometimes you'll you'll ping one right back to me really quickly, but other times you'll take a few days. And and, and I completely understand that because email is not instant messenger. How do you tame and manage things like email? Well, frankly, maybe we're a little bit different. But the reason I tame uh, the, the way I was able to effectively tame it is internally. We don't use any email now. We only use Slack, which is you know an app for internal communication among the company. So I get very few internal emails, which is great. So I know that all my emails are external email, and uh, I can batch that and prioritize that, and only look at it a couple times per day. And when I'm traveling, I know when am I gonna when am I gonna get through all of my email. I love to sit down on an airplane, not have Wi-Fi look at all the email that's in my inbox and just reply to all of it. And I know that when I reply to it, I'm not going to, in instant message format, get an email back. So I can just uh, send the emails for an hour straight on an airplane, close down the computer and be done with it. Yeah, I remember when I was in B2B technology sales, um, the amount of email I used to get was just insane. And the only way I could really get through it effectively was by batching it and then processing it offline exactly how you describe because otherwise you just send one you get one back it's just no no winning that game absolutely what about social media how do you manage that in your in your life because social media can be a real suck in terms of productivity so how do you yeah. tame that well i'll tell you two things so so number one is i i learned maybe a year ago someone made the comment that they were consuming 
they were consuming media, they were consuming content that was reactive rather than proactive. So proactive is, I'm going to go buy this book because I really want to read this book. Or I want to listen to Lawrence's podcast, so I'm going to download it and I'm going to listen to it. That's proactive. I've decided these are the things I'm interested in and I really want to consume them. Well, so much of social media for me, and I, I don't think I'm alone here, became reactive. I would be standing in line waiting for a coffee and I would be scrolling through a Facebook feed, for example, or Instagram, and I would click on something and pretty soon I'm watching a video or reading an article that I was not seeking out it was reactive it was just in my feed so now I'm reading it and I thought my goodness there's a decent percentage of my day that what I'm consuming is reactive rather than proactive and so my habits were when I was waiting in a line I would do that when I was like before I would go to bed at night that's what I would do sometimes when I would wake up in the morning not sometimes most of the time I would reach for my phone and of course I'm checking in on three four different social platforms and before I know it 12 15 minutes have gone by and I've consumed nothing but reactive where why didn't I just roll over in bed grab the book that I'm reading and read that for 15 minutes that's something I wanted to read that was going to enrich me and inform me and educate me and so I've tried to get away from anything that's reactive and only be proactive the second thing is I've tried to shut down my social media use and just the use of my phone when I'm doing a different activity. And, and here's the best example for me. And I keep going back to this because I, I really enjoy watching football and football is escapism for me. Um, on Thanksgiving in two days on Thursday, the, the Vikings, our, our team will play at 11.30 a.m. It's a big deal to play on Thanksgiving. And I'm going to be at my parents' house with family watching that game. And I will have to force myself to put my phone down. Otherwise, I'm constantly looking at social media, responding to someone on social media, text messaging someone, looking at a Snapchat, and I'm thinking, one of my favorite things in the world to do is watch a football game with my family, and my head's been down in my damn phone for the last hour. And so it's incredible how that can become so ad ad addictive, even though it's not you know, something that I really enjoy. So I've forced myself to, to put the phone down. You know, And I, I have a I use, uh, I think Tim Ferriss talks about it in Tools for Titans, but the five-minute journal. Mm -hmm. So I use a five-minute journal every morning as a part of my morning routine. And one of the things that five-minute journal asks is uh, – you know how can how can you really optimize your day, or what would what would make today great? And I'll often write down a hey, less phone or no phone during you know X Y Z whatever activity I have coming up. And we have a lot of meetings in the company now where when you walk into the meeting or when you walk into the conference room, everyone puts their phone in one area so the phones aren't even around. Yeah, that's great. I think it's a great um, rule to have. Um, I want to ask some questions on leadership. I know this is something that you, you, you're passionate about and something that you talk about a lot when you go to conferences and things like that. What, what does leadership mean to you? So ultimately, I think leadership involves providing the direction for the organization. So at some point, someone needs to say, this is the, this is the direction that we are moving in. This is... Um, this is, uh, we are not going to be a rudderless ship and we need to understand what direction we're pointed in. And I think ultimately that's where leadership starts. But really it involves where we're going and then how we're going to get there. So to me, when we, we think about the, the vision component of, of, of leadership, it's where are we going long term? What do we believe in? What are the beliefs of the organization? What's the purpose of the organization? And then it's really creating alignment around all those things. So we always say that the strength of a strong vision, a vision of a, a business, okay, so a visionary leadership creates a, a business where there's vision alignment. Everyone's rowing in the same direction. Is that vision has to be shared by all. And key terminology is it's not shared with all, it is in fact shared by all, meaning everybody in the organization has to have the same answer to a small set of questions. And we have to make sure that we're truly rowing in the same direction. I learned very early on, Lawrence, that nobody 
wanted, I mean, I intuitively understood this. Nobody actually wanted the work from me. One of the few things I despise is when a speaker, when an entrepreneur, when a leader, when an owner says, you know, so-and-so works for me. And I thought, well, God, nobody wants to work for me. No one says, I want to go to college and I want to build my career. and I want to work for Luke. Instead, they want to work for the vision. They want to work for the greater good. In our terminology, we use the word greater good or the terminology greater good, but greater good just means that vision component of the business, where we're going and how we're going to get there and what those priorities are. So great leadership involves constantly over communicating around where we're headed and what's important to us. And so I constantly think about what's important to us, what are our values, and I share that with the organization so that they make sure that they are, first of all, inspired by it, that they're rowing in the same direction. We're all trying to achieve really essentially the, the same thing. How do you inspire people to actually, actually follow that vision, that shared vision? Yeah, well, first of all, they have to they have to want the same things. I mean, we have really like six elements that that turn me on, six things that I want Discover Strength to constantly be interacting with. And I share those six things with the rest of our team. And man, if if they're if they're the right person, they're gonna be turned on by those things. And I can't I'm probably not gonna be able to motivate them to be turned on by those things. Those things have to just resonate with that person. And luckily, we've always we've always paid tremendous attention to onboarding people, hiring people, and trying to retain people that are turned on by these things. But you have to tell stories and use analogies to articulate where you're going and what those priorities are. And and people say, wow, that's where I want to go also. So um, related to this is a question that was submitted about um, team team management. Um, And the question was, how do you provide your team with performance feedback and conduct performance reviews? So every 90 days, we do what's called the the quarterly conversation. So this replaces the traditional one-on-one or the traditional review. So the quarterly conversation is always, here's a a few bullets. The quarterly conversation occurs every 90 days. It is always done off-site. So it's never in an office. It's always over coffee, over lunch, over a walk, um, but it's out of the office. And we're really going to touch base on three things. We're going to touch base on the person's key roles. So everybody in the organization has five key roles. So we're going to talk about whether or not you get, want, and have the capacity to do your five key roles. Now, that direct report is going to talk about they're going to assess themselves, and then the manager is going to assess that key key, um, uh, direct report. The next thing they're going to move on to is our 90-day priorities. So what those 90-day projects are. We're going to talk about how are you progressing on those projects? Are you on? Are you off track? And then lastly, and I'm saying lastly to you, but this is always the first thing that we talk about is, are you living? Are you aligned with our four core values? And that's always the first thing we talk about. And then we grade people. You either get a plus a plus minus or a minus on each one of those core values. And and if I'm if you're my manager, Lawrence, I'm gonna grade myself and you're also gonna grade me. And then we're gonna have some conversation to provide context around um, each one of those each one of those values. So those are the three things your key roles, your ninety day projects or priorities, and then your core values. And so if we're if we're touching base on those every 90 days and really quantifying performance around all those things, my goodness, it creates tremendous alignment and it creates uh, a strengthened relationship between manager and direct report. This takes between 30 minutes and up to maybe an hour and 15 minutes, depending on the person. We always schedule it four, five, six weeks in advance, so it's never a surprise. None of it goes in the file. So I'll take notes to prepare for this, and all of our managers will take notes to prepare for it, but we don't file it away. We just take notes that we're prepared to have a rich conversation. The ultimate, uh, the ultimate purpose of this is to look across the table, look your direct report in the eye, and just have a rich conversation. Provide them with 
uh, feedback around those three things. And here's the other, I guess, litmus test is you both have to walk away better. In the traditional format of performance reviews, if you're my direct report, Lawrence, I sit you down and I say, Lawrence, this is what you're doing well. This is what you're not doing well. This is where you're off track. This is where I need improvement. You got it. And you say, you bet. And then I pat you on the, the butt and then you're out the door. Okay. In this, this model, the format is we both have to walk away better. So I'm going to tell you what I expect of you as my direct report, but you're also going to tell me what you need from me in terms of resources and tools and how I can manage you more effectively. The ultimate litmus test of did we do this well is when this meeting is over, do we both walk away from this table better? Did I become a better manager and did you become better in, in whatever your specific role as uh, role in as my direct report? How big is your whole team at the moment? Your how many employees do you have? Thirty-eight. And okay, so how do you how do you protect against the bias that people are going to have when grading they are their superiors or their managers? Yeah, be more specific. So, like, if for instance, you know, you're the CEO, everyone wants to keep Luke happy. Um, or maybe you don't hire people that think like that. But would they not gr- grade you more biased? positively because they want to keep you happy well well, i think we just yeah great that's a good question we we try to create a culture of brutal honesty um i mean you have to tell me where i'm deficient you have to tell me what i need to work on and uh, for for 11 years i think and particularly the last three four five years we've been really good at that Uh, i'll have I mean, you know, some of my direct reports, Hannah and Brandon, they will look directly at me and say, you are not doing this and I need you to do this. You are falling short on this. And then it's my responsibility to be humble and receive that feedback and not disagree with it and accept it and say, okay, I'm going to commit to it. And I'm going to, I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to listen to you. And then I'm going to make sure that I go to work on, on that. So that's a cultural thing is you got to have a culture where you can give that, that direct feedback and that people want that feedback. And it goes back to, if you're familiar with Carol Dweck and her work on mindset. I mean, you either have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. And if you have a growth mindset and you get feedback from from anybody in the team, you better be willing to accept that feedback and use it to help you to help you grow. Yeah. Um, no, good stuff. I want to move on to a couple of questions on uh, working with clients, and then I'm just going to ask you some high intensity training questions. I can't, you know, do an interview without asking you some of those questions. Um, how do Discover Strength currently run small group workouts? Yep, a small group workout is a three to one ratio. So we have one trainer training three clients. Now, contrasted from a one on one workout, a one on one workout is 30 minutes long. Okay, a small group workout is 45 minutes long, even though the number of exercises would be the same. It just takes us a little bit longer to get through it. And the reason we landed at a three to one ratio is three to one is all we could handle where we could still record everything the client is doing. The client doesn't record anything. They never touch their workout card or their clipboard. We record everything. And we are more so than I think a lot of high intensity training or strength training practitioners in general, we're, we're kind of obsessed with advanced overload techniques. And so a three to one ratio allows the trainer to be with the client at the point of muscle failure. That's our promise to every client is you will never finish a set and not have us doing some type of advanced overload technique with you. And so it's all about pacing the start of those sets. So I may say, okay, Lawrence, you're on an overhead press, you're on a shoulder press, I want you to go ahead and start. And I watch your first rep and I coach your first rep and then I say I want it to be replicated from there on out. Then I'll walk away and I'll start somebody else on a leg extension exercise. But I'm going to wait until you are six or seven reps into your set. If you're going to do 12 reps at like a two to four uh, second cadence or repetition duration. So that person does their first rep and I watch them do their first rep. So then I turn away from that person. You're nearing the point of muscle failure and I can now do a couple assisted reps with you, a breakdown set with you, a static hold, a long eccentric. I can do a manual resistance rep at the end of the set. I can do something at the end of the set with you while that person is just starting their set and doing a few reps. In addition, we're always coaching from across the room. So I may be doing something with you. I may be doing assisted reps with you, but I can provide 
specific positive feedback to someone that's on the abductor machine across the room. I can comment on their paws. I can make sure that they're not driving their feet into the foot platform and instead they're just driving through the pads. I can make sure that their hips are all the way back. I can make sure their hands are relaxed. I can make sure they're avoiding Valsalva and give them constant positive specific feedback from across the room, which we're really, really into feedback. We do not give feedback when someone does something wrong. We constantly give feedback anytime someone does something right. So that three to one ratio allows us to make sure that we can get to everybody, be at failure with everybody, and then record everything. Now, it's a three to one ratio, but we often will have five, six, seven clients in a group. So that just means we have more trainers in that group. Now, it's a three to one ratio, but as soon as we have five clients, we cap it at five clients for two trainers, and we cap it at seven clients for three trainers. So that three to one ratio actually goes down. The ratio becomes more favorable for our client as uh, as the group becomes larger. And seven clients is the most that we'll take in a group. So that's three trainers working with seven clients, and then they are communicating with each other and they're kind of broken into different zones of the room. So I may be watching four, five, six exercises or machines in one area. Another trainer is watching and supervising four, five, six in a given area, and we're passing the clients from exercise to exercise throughout the room. And it allows us to get everything done in 45 minutes, and essentially every client is virtually personal trained. Now, here's the big difference for us. Everything in a group is essentially a two-second, four-second cadence. Every once in a while, we have a few workouts where we use a few different protocols, but during our one-on-one workouts, we use a host of different repetition durations, protocols, how we execute that exercise. We don't do that during groups because we think it's too hard to make sure all those protocols are executed perfectly. So our one-on-one client gets more variation in, I guess, the exercise stimulus than our group client does. I don't. How long have you been doing the small group workouts for? 11 years. I mean, we, we started oh. with workouts the day we opened. Oh, right. I thought it was just one-on-one, and I thought it was a new, a new thing, but you've been doing it for, as you said, 11 yep. years there. Forever, yeah. Is it, a, is it a less expensive service? Yep. For us right now, our one-on-one workouts for 30 minutes start at $53 and go up to $63, depending who your workout workout is with. And our group workouts are $32. So it's much less expensive for the client, but our trainer still generates actually more revenue per unit of time. So when we, when we close a new client and that client's a group client, we're still excited about that because in my 45 minute period, I'm able to, to generate almost a hundred dollars in that 45 minute period, which is, which is really good. So in an hour we're generating, you know, well over a hundred dollars, closer to about one hundred and twenty-five dollars an hour. So, another question in relation to working with clients: How do you deal with um, clients who have orthopedic problems? Like, how do you how do you tailor strength training protocol to someone with orthopedic issues? Well, the first thing we would say is it depends on the client and it depends on the specific orthopedic issue. But I will tell you this: is being able to effectively do that is paramount to be able to grow, to have a large volume of clients and a large volume of sessions. I learned this when I was a strength coach in the NFL and I worked for Steve Wetzel, who was the head strength coach for the Minnesota Vikings. And he said this quote, this was like 1999, he told me this. He said, anybody can train a healthy athlete. That's easy. It's training the athlete that's injured that actually really showcases your skill set. That's very true for athletes, and my goodness, it is so much more true for the general population because so many of our clients have a low back issue, have a knee issue, have a hip issue, and we need to understand what are the three, four, five adjustments or tweaks that we can make to make the exercise um, make the exercise uh palatable for that client or not do that exercise, do an exercise that has less orthopedic stress or biomechanical stress. So how have we cultivated this approach? I mean, it's borrowing from everybody that's out there from Bill De Simone to just the things we've learned on the floor to changing ranges of motion to changing the amount of weight that we're using to changing repetition speeds to saying, hey, we're not going to use this exercise or we will use this exercise. We're just going to use a different seat setting and a different handle. So we generally let pain be our guide and if we can move through a pain-free range of motion or change a range of motion so that someone can operate pain-free then we'll always do that and we're 
we're always able to do that. And even if it means train the left limb and not the right rim, uh, right limb, there's a little bit of bilateral transfer or cross transfer. So if we strengthen just the left side, we know the right side is going to receive some of that benefit. And remember, most of our clients' goals are to improve their body composition, increase resting metabolic rate. So if we can train as much healthy tissue as possible, we're going to have a positive influence on resting metabolic rate and, and body composition as a whole. So that I just gave you a lot of answers to that question, but it depends. Uh, what are the what are the changes we need to make exercise by exercise? And then for us, how are we recording and documenting those changes? Because when a client trains at, at, at Discover Strength, they don't train with one trainer. They can rotate through and train with any of our trainers. So if you trained with Andy last time and you're having a particular knee issue, I need to know the exact range of motion that you're moving through on a medic's leg extension. I need to know what we're doing or what we're not doing at the point of failure based on your orthopedic concern. I need to know what pain you had in your last workout. So we have to have a documentation system where we're communicating all of those things. It can't be in one trainer's head because, like I said, we're, you could bounce between you know 25 different trainers. And this goes back to what you're saying about that app and how that app is going to obviously help so many areas of your business, particularly that as well. Sure. Um, so on that similar note, um, what type of training do you recommend for seniors over 70? Yeah, so I would say very, very similar to someone who is 32 years old. The difference being, and I laugh when I think about this, is if you're over 70, particularly if you're a female, but if you're over 70 in general and you're concerned about bone mineral density, then we know that the load has to be decently heavy. I mean, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, the only population and the only outcome from resistance training that requires a heavy load is seniors and seniors that are interested in improving their bone mineral density. I mean, we can maximize muscle strength and hypertrophy with a relatively light weight and just do more repetitions. You cannot maximize bone mineral density unless you have a heavy enough load. So I think it's coincidental. And I always talk about this when I when I give presentations on the topic, I always say we're, we're not slightly off track in our approach to exercise. We are literally pointed 180 degrees in the wrong direction because of what have, we, what have we always told grandma to do? We said, grandma, lift soup cans, lift a light weight and do like 30 repetitions. Well, grandma is the one population that needs to lift a heavier weight and do fewer repetitions. You know, Meanwhile, 22-year-old bros in the gym, we're telling them to lift a heavier weight and do less repetitions where that bro really can use a much lighter weight and do more repetition so the 70 year old the prescription the exercises should be very similar they just need to make sure that they're using a, a heavy enough load to induce fatigue in a in a uh, i would say a lower repetition range so maybe under 15 repetitions they're not doing 30 or 40 repetitions with an incredibly light weight yeah this is refreshing to hear because i um you make me feel a lot more comfortable when i try and make my grandma walk up the stairs you know she's 85 i think now and it's so funny how everyone around me is like oh let me do that for you let me you know don't get up and i'm like no she needs to do these things absolutely in order to preserve that physical capability and that what little muscle mass she has so yeah i just i mean part of the, this issue this misunderstanding is one of the things that really motivates me to do this podcast uh, and to get and to grow the awareness of not just high intensity training but just resistance training in general and i'm sure you have a similar motivation with discover strength lawrence absolutely 100 percent. one thing i always thought was was interesting i'm sure you've you've come across or maybe you've even spoken to James Fisher or James Steele, okay, about some research they did in their lab where they had people trained to failure close to 8 to 12 repetitions and they had people trained to failure and some of them did as many as 30 to 50 repetitions on a leg extension well the muscle strength hypertrophy outcomes were the same okay and that's something we're, we're all familiar with at this point or i shouldn't say we all most people that listen to your podcast are familiar with that however the perceived discomfort in the group that performed 30 or 40 or 50 repetitions was enormous relative to failing at 8 to 12 repetitions. So we know that doing higher repetitions to failure is much more uncomfortable. So I think it's funny that the one population we'd said, hey, you should probably do like 30 repetitions with a light weight was grandma. Like we were not only not giving grandma enough weight to load her bone and meaningfully improve her bone mineral density or bone mass, but we we're also torturing her, telling her to do a lot of repetitions with a light weight. 
So um, we were given a gram of poor advice. Definitely. Um, that point you made with regard to greater loads being important for bone mineral density, is there conclusive literature about that? I wasn't, I wasn't aware that um, that was that was kind of like there was enough evidence to show that yeah i think there's plenty of evidence to show it and i think there's interestingly enough there's all there's also now just in the last two years enough evidence to say that it's very very safe that even women with very low low to very low bone mass um, respond well to heavier load resistance training Do which of course was the worry was the worry is like well this is a very grandma's brittle she can't handle a, a decent load and the trials the early trials that have showed uh, that have utilized heavier loads have always produced really good results and 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 safety and so forth well in that case should younger trainees prioritize higher loads then if they want to have better bone mineral density and, and preserve that later on in life i would say two things i would say first of all at what juncture in the lifespan is it most important to focus on improving bone mineral density well interestingly enough for females it's probably when a female is a, a roughly 10 years of age you know they say that osteoporosis is really a um an adolescent disease with geriatric manifestations. So the time that a female can that can most appreciably increase bone mineral density is when she is young, when she's 10 years old. Well, again, we're having our 10-year-olds lift really light weights and do a lot of repetitions. And so we probably maybe need to focus on a little bit more load at that age for sure. But Lawrence, I don't think the average guy, the average male that's in his 20s or 30s and that's into resistance training is using a light load. I mean, I think more often than not, that guy is using a heavy load. You could honestly, when I walk into a gym and I see idiots throwing weights around, part of me, I think they're getting very little in the way of muscular benefit, very little muscle tension. They're, they're, they're positively uh, uh, creating incredible forces on their joints, which is negative. But the one positive thing they probably are doing is putting enough load on their, their bones to, to maximize bone mineral density. Okay. Um, so you got the resistance exercise conference next year, which we're all very excited about. I will be, I, I literally purchased my flights very recently, so can't wait to finally, well, obviously we've met before, but meet you again and uh, meet a lot of the attendants who are, or attendees who are listeners of the podcast. So really excited about that. Um, do you want to just give us a little preview? Yeah, so... March 9th and 10th, Friday and Saturday in Minneapolis. This is the eighth year of the conference. When it comes down to it, Lawrence, we started doing the conference because I wanted to attend a conference that was a mix of just tremendous researchers, strength coaches, practitioners, bring them together and share evidence-based, high-intensity resistance training information. And that, that conference didn't exist. I wish it did. And so we said, well, we have to, we have to host it. And really what it's become is it's the one event per year that I think the resistance training professional needs to attend. So they are up to date on the latest science and application. So that's number one, okay? And number two, is it's the one opportunity to experience just tremendous collegiality. Um, in our field, the practitioner doesn't get a chance to interact with other practitioners very often. And one of the things that we've noticed that our attendees really appreciate is the opportunity just to spend time together and share stories and talk. I mean, I'm thinking about our, our conference last year, and I'm picturing Wayne Westcott with Jim Flanagan and Dr. Ellington Darden and Kim Wood and Fred Hahn and, and James Fisher bringing these people together, sitting at the same table over dinner or a drink with our attendees and just engaging in rich conversation. I mean, that is the highlight of the conference. I mean, I clearly I think learning and, and, and listening to James Fisher present seven new studies is also really exciting. But that collegiality component is, is important. And that's why I've always been committed to making sure that it was, in fact, a live conference. And we no longer sell DVDs for the conference for that reason, because we thought, oh, heck, you can watch a DVD and learn something. But just being there and being able to interact with these people is, is what's so incredibly important. And we've been fortunate to have people from across the U.S. And I think last year we had people from four different countries and we're excited of course to to have you here and do a little bit of a corporate warrior podcast uh um, meet up, if you will, because I think everyone that's at the conference is a listener of your podcast. So we're thrilled about that. And I think it's the one thing, it's the, the, it's the two day period on my calendar each year that I look forward to the most. And not because we're hosting it, because I just enjoy attending it and, and being a part of it. I'm, uh, 
I'm flying into Chicago first. Um, uh, what five days before and sure. ha- having a little holiday with my partner beforehand obviously she's going to come as well um, so I'm really hoping I can get tickets to a Bulls game while I'm in Chicago so if you know anyone and I can get preferential rates Luke I'd appreciate it <laughs> there you go yeah we did I did that with uh, coincidentally with James Fisher last year so right after the conference we flew the next day to Chicago oh, wow. and we went to a Bulls game it was his first Bulls game and we had a great time he's a big basketball guy like yourself that's so. right We'll have oh, to connect. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm very, very excited. And uh, yeah, and I hope if you're listening, I I implore you to, to get involved and, and come along because um, I'd love to meet you in person as well. Um, Luke, you always, you know, we, we have very similar interests in, in regard to like learning and productivity and that type of thing. I'd love to finish on just what you're currently reading. I know you've hinted at this a little bit already. You know, what, what books are you reading at the moment? What's had the biggest impact on you recently? All right, let me give you let me give you a couple of them. So, I, to be honest, I'm currently reading the 700 page uh, biography of John D. Rockefeller. So that is just a, a bear to tackle, but I'm reading that. Uh, I'm reading an excellent book right now, a new book by Scott Galloway called The Four. And I think this is up your alley, and I think many of your listeners will find it interesting. It's about Google, Amazon, Apple, and Facebook, and about how those four companies are essentially taking over the world. Really interesting read. I mentioned great CEOs are lazy. Man, if you're operating a business in any way, this is a really cool, uh, really cool listen. Um, Another book that I read recently is called The Greatest Business Decisions of All Time. That's a phenomenal read. That's a Vern Harnish book also. Um, And I think uh, I, I maybe recommended this one before. But from a marketing standpoint, I still think the best book is an old classic from the better part of three decades ago, The 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing. Yeah. You can't listen to that book and not think, whoa, 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 I'm really off track in so many things I'm doing in my business. And so I think that's a, a great book that I go back to on a regular basis because I think so many of the elements, so many of those 22 immutable laws are truly timeless. And I think we grow faster and scale faster if we are uh, focused around uh, focused around those things. Yeah, it's on the, it's on the bookshelf behind me. Uh, the Law of Category I, I revisited recently as we discussed. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Ch- changing the focus of the show a little bit more. Um, Luke, this has been so much fun. What's the, the best way for people to find out more about you and what you're up to? Well, a couple things. They can always go to our website, uh, www.discoverstrength.com. Okay, they can follow us on on Facebook. They can follow me or friend me on Facebook, and then anyone can always email me. I'm pretty good with with getting back to email. It's it's Luke at discoverstrength.com, and then I'll, I should mention this also, Lawrence, because we didn't touch on it. Um, many of your listeners know that I, I do this, but once a quarter. I do a, a two-day kind of deep dive on the, the business elements of, of high-intensity training. And I've done this. I do it with Jim Flanagan, and we actually do it in Florida. So uh, many of your, your listeners probably are on our email list and, and get this. But my goodness, over the last year and a half, we've had some incredible high-intensity training operators that have come and taken this course, and it's a, a higher a higher price ticket. I mean, we charge $2,000 for the two days, but the mindset is you pay the $2,000, and we're going to give you the tools to make an additional $500,000 over the next year. I mean, that is how the course is constructed. So I think it's a great investment in, in uh, your time. So that's a great way to connect. We keep that course really, really small. And so if someone's interested, um, they can always, uh, clearly that's not my A job. So um, if they're interested, they can always shoot me an email on that as well. Yeah, I saw the website for that course. It looks good. Obviously, I'm speaking to Jim Fanagan soon as well. So I'm excited to do that. <laughs> good. Yeah, you'll have fun with Jim. And for everyone listening, if you want to get access to all of the show notes, links and resources, everything that both Luke and I have spoken about um, for this episode and all episodes, so to get a full list of all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org. 
And until next time, guys, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Before you head off, head on over to corpwarrior.com. That's C-O-R-P warrior.com to get your free high-intensity training, Google progress chart, and ebook with six interview transcripts of some of my top guests, including Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, and Bill De Simone on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health in an efficient, effective, and sustainable way. These transcripts are deliberately not verbatim. Instead, they've been transcribed in an easy-read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to quickly pick out what you need and start getting results. To get your ebook, head on over to corpwarrior.com, enter your email address, then check your email for an email from me with a confirmation link. Once you click the link, you will be instantly redirected to a PDF version of the transcripts. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I've ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly, and I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done, and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity training trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and how you can get $1,000 off software licensing when you place an order, that's right guys, $1,000 off, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $1,000 off software licensing when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. This episode is brought to you by the Resistance Exercise Conference, the science and application of strength training for health and human performance. Would you like to learn from the top strength training researchers, network and connect with other exercise professionals from all over the world, join a welcome reception on a Friday night to build relationships with other strength training professionals, experience an early morning workout from an expert trainer to kickstart your Saturday, and get inspired, rejuvenated, and focus on your strength training business I certainly do, and that is why I am attending and interviewing all of the speakers at the event. The Resistance Exercise Conference will be held on the 9th and 10th of March 2018 in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the Commons Hotel. To get 10% off your entry fee, head on over to resistanceexerciseconference.com, click the registration button, and enter Corporate Warrior 10 in the promo code field in PayPal. I'm very excited about this and I've wanted to attend for years. Sign up now at resistanceexerciseconference.com and get 10% off with promo code CorporateWarrior10 and I look forward to meeting you in person.